And should I look at you or should I look at the camera? Whatever you're comfortable with doing. Yeah, got it. Hello, and welcome to Jason Cavanis Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cavanis. Our guest today is Andrew Klein. Andrew, are you ready to be great today? Yeah. Andrew Klein has been working with startups and emerging growth companies for more than a decade. He's worked as a founder, as an outside advisor for both entrepreneurial teams and their investors. This capacity has managed the strategic operations and funding of companies in a variety of, variety of industries with specific inter, in, expertise in SaaS, healthcare, hospitality, consumer products, energy, and construction. Companies with Andrew's direct involvement have raised almost $90 million in debt and equity. Andrew, thank you for being here today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I appreciate you inviting me. So Andrew, well, let's go back to your past. You've, you've had a lot of entrepreneurial activities, a lot of you know, deep involvement in tech startups and small business. Way, way back today, you were with a company called, I think it's called Mobata. I think it was like a French pastry company. <laughs> well, it's a little bit a uh, longer story than that. So I was originally a French major in college and I had actually studied abroad in France. And I happened to be the first customer of Starbucks in Paris. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And so uh, when I came back to America, I thought I should do what Howard Schultz did and bring something back from Europe and start a company. But I also realized that business, if I was going to do business, it was really important I understood the numbers. And so I changed my major from French to accounting, but I still had this idea in the back of the head that I wanted to start my own business and uh, bring something back from Europe. So I actually started a chain of crepe restaurants, you know, like the very thin pancakes. So it's called crepe, not creep. Oh, uh, crepe. And I think a lot of people would say that wrong, right? Crepe, right. Crepe, a lot of people crepes, did call me a crepes. creep for a variety of reasons. Not, many not related to my uh, restaurant <laughs> business. But um, no, so, so Mobata, uh, it was Mobata Crepes to Go. So it was essentially a Chipotle of crepe making. And so we had breakfast, lunch, dinner, crepes. And I actually started that while I was in college. Um, and I have a whole bunch of stories about how I was able to start doing the business before getting any funding. We actually had no funding uh, to do that business. I bootstrapped it from the ground up through doing caterings and creating creative, uh, uh, essentially investments from our landlord to build out the location and stuff like that. But yeah, my first business when I was 20 years old was, uh, was slinging crepes. That's, that's amazing. And so what, what, what did you learn from entrepreneur experience way back then that you, you still use today or advise other people to use? Yeah, so what we ended up growing to three locations and over a million in sales. And I was only 22 years old. And when you're in college and you're starting a business, they really push for the mentors. And I'd gone to some of these mentor mixers. And there are a couple of people that were kind of like a old retired banker or kind of retired guys that wanted to do something new. And I just didn't I really identify with any of those people. Um, however, I did find a mentor who was uh, an executive at Starbucks, uh, who was very valuable to have. And I think back in the day when the economy crashed um, back in 2007 with the housing crisis, I kind of wish that I would have built up a bigger um, group of sort of supporters and mentors. And so I always encourage entrepreneurs to find the, their like ideal mentor reach out to them, tell them about their business and try and stay, you know, in contact with them. I think if there's one thing I could have done better when I was doing the crepe business was get more input from experienced restaurateurs instead of thinking I had to reinvent everything. So Andrew, that's, that's, that's pretty good success at a young age. How did you deal with the success or was that success too much for you at that young of age? Yeah, I had a bad attitude. <laughs> no, you know, I was, uh, it, it was so busy and Pretty much every time that we had a profit, I invested it back into the business, which is how in you know two or three years, we were able to grow from one little catering cart all the way up to three locations. Um, and you know what, what was the hardest thing was everything was going great and, and going well until the economy crashed back in 2007. And once the housing crisis happened and people were getting laid off, I really struggled with... Uh, feeling like it wasn't a success anymore. The, the success part was kind of easy. And, you know, at the scale that we were at, there was a lot of moving parts and a lot of employees. And so a million dollars a year in sales 
at the end of the day, wasn't, you know, Ferraris and, and, uh, you know, penthouse condos. It was, it was enough to continue to grow the business. But, uh, when the housing crisis and the whole bottom dropped out of the market, um, it got really difficult to run that business. And so I think the biggest learning that I had from that business was how to work in times of crisis and, and how to manage cash flow when you don't have a lot of cash flow. So you mentioned a finer mentor. I, I, and this is my opinion. I think so many people nowadays, whether they're right out of college or people our age or whatever the case would be, their attitude is usually like, I don't need a mentor or what can a mentor teach me? Or uh, right. it's, it's ego is all this other stuff. Why, why is this? Is this <laughs> well, I mean, when you're 22 and you do a million dollars a year, it's hard, it's hard yeah. to think that you need a mentor, but I think, you know, that's the time when you need them most uh, because there's, when you have that much cash flow sort of at a young age, you're going to have a lot of blind spots. And so I think, I think that instead of saying you need to go find a mentor, like an older, you know, banker type guy or an older university mentor, I think that you need to shoot high and find who do you emulate, you know? So I really emulated uh, Starbucks and Howard Schultz because I'd met him in person when I was in, in France and I brought back a business like he did from Italy and so I look for people, Howard Schultz was clearly too busy running a large publicly traded company, but some of his senior executives were more than willing to meet with me. And so I met the head of R&D at Starbucks and, uh, and he was a mentor on a very light basis. I met their chief of staff, I met some other HR people. And so I think had I nurtured those relationships better, we might have a, you know, a Chipotle of crepes today. <laughs> but uh, I always say, find, find a mentor that you respect and someone that you would emulate to be and, and go for that. So let's say, you know, they say you're the, you're the sum of the top five people you're with. You start a business and your five people around you are like, they're not really mentor mature, right? And you don't have the access to mentors. How, how do you find one like besides cold calling and like quote unquote stalking people, right? What's your, what's the, what do you be mentor for that? Well, I was just going to say, you got to stalk people and then cold call them. <laughs> um, but no, so, uh, so I met my, my best mentor is a guy named Arthur Rubenfeld who was uh, Howard Schultz's uh, right, right side guy. And um, I met him because I, uh, I just opened, I, I opened my heart to luck and I happened to be at a restaurant that he invested in. And, uh, and I made it clear to the owner of the restaurant, hey, if Arthur ever comes in, introduce me. And so I think if you can invite luck, you can stumble upon people. Uh, and particularly here in Seattle, it was fairly easy because you know Starbucks was based here and all these people uh, a lot of great um, uh, executives are, are here in Seattle. But I think LinkedIn is a really great tool. Uh, and especially if you write something that's more interesting of why that person would be your perfect mentor, I think they're likely to respond back. And I think there's also a lot of tools where you can, I guess, stalk people <laughs> and find out a little bit more about them and on their social platforms. So if I got an Instagram message, um, I would read it. You know, I, I don't get a ton of Instagram messages. And so if an Instagram message came through, I typically would read it. Um, the only ones I get right now are spam. But if, 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 you know, someone reached out to me through an Instagram message or a Facebook post, it's something different, right? Or, yeah. It's, it's a little bit different. And, and even on LinkedIn, I get a ton of LinkedIn inquiries from recruiters and stuff like that, or people trying to sell me stuff. Um, but I think if something's interesting and, and unique, and you're hitting them from a couple different places, they're apt to, to invite you in or at least do a Zoom meeting with them. I think people underestimate the, this asking, right? I mean, some people think, oh, I, I can ask Andrew. He'll never respond, ever respond or never say yes. But, you know, good chance you might at least respond or say yes, right? A lot of people, if people want to help people out there, right? You just got to ask, you know? Absolutely. What was Wayne Gretzky say one time you missed 100% of the shots you don't take or something like that? Yeah, I, th I think it's, it's a little bit more than that uh, from the statistic I heard. But yeah, if you, if you don't try, you know, the worst case scenario that you're going to have is the scenario that you're currently in, right? Yeah, so. if they say no, maybe they might pass you on to someone else, you know, with all this, I can't help you, but so-and-so can help you, you know? Sure, yeah, absolutely. So next, let's talk about Builders Cloud, a company you had with Techstars. Was that Techstars in Seattle or in different locations? Yeah, it was actually a Seattle Techstars back in 2012. So I was, um, I'd... I was working for a uh, startup that had sold to Coinstar um, that was doing coffee kiosks. And we'd sort of gotten to the point where that company was well nested within Coinstar. And my job as the finance and accounting sort of person 
was sort of absorbed by a lot of their other services. So I was more of a, a token reporting person than actually doing a ton of work. So I had a lot of capacity. And so at that point, I was helping out friends start businesses and such. And so Builders Cloud came to me because it was a buddy of mine who had expertise in the construction industry. And he said, hey, here's a huge problem that I have in construction. I'm a subcontractor and they update plans. And then the plans that I originally bid on are now out of date. There's got to be a way that you can send this through a smartphone. And so Builders Cloud, the whole idea was, let's take these gigantic, you know, 300 unit apartment projects, put them into a, a smartphone compatible format via the cloud. And this is early cloud 2012. And let's just text that out to people that are working on the project so they can open the plan on the smartphone and annotate on it and such. And, and what we did was we really went through the market validation uh, pretty seriously because I was working at a big company and, and he was a construction guy before. So I ran him through some of the methodical, how do you validate a customer? How do you validate with investors? And we ended up raising, um, raising money before getting into Techstars. And then uh, we also, through a lot of these kind of stalker things and being in the right place at the right time, we were able to meet uh, high-level people at, at um, 500 startups at the time and also at Techstars. And so, um, so we, were, we applied for Techstars, we got in. The Techstars network is invaluable and the experience of going through Techstars, particularly around validating product market fit, is such an important thing for entrepreneurs. Because if you can go through the process that Techstars has, you'll find out whether or not customers want to buy your product. You'll find out whether or not investors will want to invest in your company. And in general, those companies are substantially more successful than just a random startup on the street. I think a lot of people won't go to Techstars because, oh, Techstars invested in us and blase, blase. But the, the real value is the network, correct? It's, the money's nice, of course, you know, investment. But the real value, I would think, has, has to be that network, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Techstars only invest 20000 in the companies. And so the investment part, and they take a big chunk of your company for that 20000 yeah, just based on that, it's like, it's kind of almost a ripoff, right? Like 20000 yeah, yeah. for several, it's like, what are you kidding me right now? Like <laughs> The financial terms are definitely a ripoff. And then they have another loan that comes, or convertible note, I guess, that comes from a partner of theirs. Sometimes Techstars fund, funds them, sometimes their partners fund them. But it's for another 100000 at a $2 million valuation for your business. And so that, again, feels kind of like a ripoff, depending on how successful your business was. We were raising outside of Techstars at a four and a half million dollar valuation. So we felt like it was a total ripoff. But I thought, let's, let's just try it out anyway, because the Techstars company seemed to be doing pretty well. But really, the, the benefit of being in Techstars, it's, it's like joining a startup fraternity. You know, you have a whole bunch of guys in any city that I go to, I can just look up the local Techstars chapter and say, Hey guys, I'm in town. You know, we we're we we're flying into Denver and we posted on the Techstars network and we said, Hey, we're trying to get to Boulder. Um, are there any entrepreneurs that are driving that way? And we had a guy that literally picked us up from the airport nice. and uh, the three of us piled into the back of his Honda Civic. And we, we drove from, he drove us from the airport in uh, Denver all the way to Boulder just because we we're part of the Techstars network. That's so. not a short trip either, is it? No, it was, I think it was an hour and a half or so. It was, it's pretty cool. And plus getting accepted like tech stars, it's like, it makes you like a quote unquote a sexy startup, right? Where you're like, you're like validated, well-known, you know, like, oh, you've been through this process. Somebody believed you, you know, like, isn't like the acceptance rate like one, two percent, like something crazy? Yeah, they say it's harder to get into tech stars than Harvard. Um, but, you know, the, the thing about tech stars is one, there's a huge filter of really successful people that go in. But two, the companies that successfully make it through tech stars to demo day they had to go through a series of market validation and product market fit to the point where they had enough traction to pitch on demo day. Mm -hmm. so, so if you went through and didn't do any of the Techstars stuff and you came out of Techstars, uh, they wouldn't let you pitch and present yourself to investors. And so all the companies that go through Techstars get some sort of validation. We work with probably 30 or 40 Techstars companies right now. Um, we have a promotion on the Techstars um, network where, where we'll, um, we'll do the accounting while they're in Techstars pretty much for free. And uh, we're just generally helpful. And, you know, we're helpful to all entrepreneurs, really. But, um, but yeah, the, the companies that go through that, the ones that really take it seriously and validate with customers, they do really well. Andrew, talk about the point of market validation or idea of validation for entrepreneurs. I, I mean, you know the deal. So many people out get the, oh, I'm going to sell, I don't know, I'm going to sell something, right? 
because I can build it quickly and it's a great computer program where the case would be. And then the market says, not so fast, young buck. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of Buck, no, uh, we, we have a, a bookkeeping assistant that you text that we call uh, Buck. And actually he's on my, he's on my shirt too. So young Buck's a good, uh, <laughs> a good pun for, a, for our firm. You know, it's, uh, it's hard as an accountant because, you know, everyone looks to me as, as to be the no man, right? You know, like, can we spend this? No. Do we have enough money to hire? No. Like I'm supposed to be this conservative no man. And, and, and no one looks to their accountant for marketing advice. But the product validation uh, issue for entrepreneurs, uh, I know that I'm weird. Uh, I think you're, you'd probably identify as weird as well, right? Yeah. You know, and if we have a business idea that we're in love with, that we think other people might like, it's probably a weird idea, right? And so we don't know whether or not people actually want this or not unless we ask other people. And so one of the things is if you fall in love with this product or you think it'd be really fun to build this tool for, you know, an app or whatnot, um, you, you might recognize that you're weird and you're the only person that really wants this. And so that's why I think it's so important to do uh, customer validation uh, because in, in customer validation, you're forced to go talk to potential customers. And as long as you don't give them leading questions where they want to say, Oh, you know, Jason's a nice guy. Let's just tell him what he wants to hear. But if you ask him really inquisitive questions, then they'll give you the feedback to validate your idea or to give you a better idea, really. And if you go with an open heart and you go really looking for advice and to really validate the product or market, it's a really great opportunity for you to find what is that product that's going to scale like wildfire, that's going to be venture fundable, and that's going to grow super big. And so, yeah, I think Bob Crimmins would be a great guy to talk to you about uh, product market fit. He's, I, I think he's an expert on it. Cool. Um, so I could be wrong, but I don't think most young boys, you know, grow up wanting to be an accountant, right? <laughs> when did you first figure out you want to be an accountant and be in this line of business? Yeah, the, um, I, I actually was a French major, like I said, because because I wanted to go to France and I wanted to spend a year there and I thought it'd be fun. And the only way to do that in college and saw the student loans pay for it is to declare a French major. So I was originally a French major, but what I realized is if, if you ever want to be wealthy, um, you can get a high income. You know, my wife's a lawyer, for example, she makes a high income, but to really build wealth, you need to build equity, not income. And so if you take your income and put it into stocks and bonds and houses and whatever, you can build your wealth. But the, the best and quickest way to build your wealth is to really own a business. And the most important thing about business is having a solid foundation. I'd say accounting is that solid foundation. And so once I made that realization that I wanted to own a business, well, one, I wanted to be rich, <laughs> which we're still working on that, but I wanted to be rich. I wanted to own a business and I wanted to understand my business in, in a way that I wasn't going to be stolen from or that, that people weren't going to take advantage of me. And the only way that I thought that I could do that was to get an accounting degree. My first accounting class I took at the University of Washington, I got a C. And it was the only class I'd ever gotten a C in. And, and it was my sort of intro to accounting class. And I thought, geez, if this is hard for me, it's probably hard for a lot of people and people would probably pay for that. And so, you know, I really got into accounting for the ability for accounting to explain businesses to me and to help me understand businesses better. So Andrew, is there a difference between being an accountant and being a CPA? Or is it the same thing? Is there different levels of school for that? Different education, different certifications? What's the breakdown between CPA and an accountant? Sure. It's sort of like a whiskey and a scotch and a bourbon, <laughs> right? So, so accountant sort of is the overarching category. A CPA is a type of accountant that can file a tax return with the IRS. So I worked at a large CPA firm. I passed some of my CPA exam tests before making a million dollars a year selling crepes and deciding I don't need to do this. So I'm not a CPA. I hire CPAs. We have CPAs that work with us, but I chose not to be a CPA because I had no intention of ever signing a tax return. Um, and so you would, you would call us more of like a boutique consulting firm or a bookkeeping firm more so than a CPA firm. Um, but yeah, a CPA is someone who files taxes. A CPA can also sign an audited financial statement, which is usually for debt covenants or for publicly traded companies. 
um, and an accountant is sort of the overall category. A bookkeeper is another subcategory of accountant like a CPA. Um, however, doesn't require as much schooling and, and does more of the back office work that you do. Okay, so Andrew, um, you also work for a company called Redwood Valua Valuation Partners. I think that's a private <laughs> equity firm or valuation thing like that. Yeah, so there, there's a couple other things on my LinkedIn, I think that you're pointing out. So we have some very strong partnerships, call them sister companies maybe, because what, what I've looked for for our business, so, so my company is Z-Counting. Um, we essentially prevent startup failure through fulfilling the financial silo of the business. And so when I think of myself, uh, working with a small business, I think of myself like the, the primary care physician, right? And so in some cases, we need really strong relationships with specialists in the same way that if you came to a primary care physician with uh, cancer, they'd send you to a specific cancer doctor. If you needed surgery, they'd send you to a surgeon. And so there were a lot of things that tech businesses run into commonly, one of which is valuations. And so I have a really strong relationship with this valuation firm. At one point, I had an email, <laughs> even at their company, um, which I which I don't anymore. But um, but both uh, Redwood Valuation and Algorithm Tax Group are very specific tasks that they do a really good job at. So Redwood Valuation does the 409A valuation for a fixed price to get the best value for employee stock option grants. And then Algorithm Tax Group, which you also probably see on my LinkedIn, um, Algorithm Tax Group does R&D tax studies and cost segmentation studies for high net worth individuals. And the, the great thing about those two partners is we're able to, you know, I, I'm within their system so I can submit all the information electronically and confidentially. I can get them to respond and provide the R&D credit documentation or the valuation documentation. And for the entrepreneur, it feels like they're just working directly with me. Um, but they get all these resources that we've negotiated great pricing. on. So usually the start founders start fundraising, like the pre C to C round, they have to do evaluation. And I think a lot of start founders, I say, I want to say confused about it, but maybe, you know, don't, can't figure it out right. So like, so you do a higher valuation or that's because they're, because they're investors, you know, if too low, they screw themselves, you know, like what's the process for this? Is, is there a process or is it better just to do a convertible or safe and just push it down the road? Yeah, I mean, I think that's like a two-hour conversation that you go through. So one of the cool things that Redwood Valuation um, does is they do a what should I fund valuation. You got to pay a little bit of money to get it, but they essentially do comparable startups at your stage and take some benchmarks on your business and will give you a valuation. The, uh, the valuation method that I like the best um, and there's a whole bunch of stuff like convertible notes and safe notes. And, you know, I think that every <laughs> safe note is the YC and everyone's created their own version of the safe. Um, so all of these don't necessarily infer a valuation, but have a valuation cap. And, and the problem with the valuation cap is if you're willing to accept that cap, you should be willing to accept that cap with a discount for an equity round. And at equity, you don't have a ticking time bomb of debt that's accruing interest and growing and, and converting. And so what I like to do is do a really great detailed budget on how much money you need to meet the next milestone. So say for the next 18 or 24 months, you know, you need X amount of money. And then go to the market and, and essentially find investors who really believe in what you're doing and work with that investor to price the deal in a fair way. And so typically startups give up between 10 and 40% of their business at every financing round that they do. And so if you're a really sexy deal that has a ton of traction that uh, people are dying to get into, you could probably sell closer to 10% of your company at that financing round. Uh, and so if you need a million dollars, $10 million valuation, um, if you're, if you're less sexy, you know, you haven't met those initial traction points, customers aren't yet beating down your door, you still need to build your software, you know, maybe 20% would be something that's, that's reasonable. So if you need a million dollars to get to that next milestone, that infers a $5 million valuation. And so go, going through uh, that process of, of looking at it less from what's this company worth, because I can tell you, three girls in a garage writing code isn't worth anything until they sell it to a customer, right? And so, so it's, it's, they're all made up numbers and you just have to face the market and see what the market is willing 
to to bear and willing to give you for valuation of the company. So the valuation it should be tied in some kind of to your burn rate, correct? Yeah, I think I, I think looking at how much burn you need to make to grow into the valuation that you feel that you have, I think should be the major consideration. Because if if your company, you know, was only worth three million dollars and you only want to give up 10% of it, there's not a lot you can do for 300 grand, uh, you know, when you're building tech software, right? And so I think that understanding what is this uh, 24 month or 18 month or even 12 month burn rate and how interested are investors in, in our product and traction, I think that's really the best way to look at it. How often do you see founders starting to raise money way too early? Like they're not ready to raise it yet. How often do you see that? Oh, every time that I see <laughs> founders, you know, it's, it's hard because, um, you know, if you're a software engineer and you can get yourself some AWS or Google credits, you can kind of start a company for free. Right. And, and if you actually have customer demand, maybe you could even get customers to pay you before you're done building. But if you're not a strong software engineer, you're building a product that takes more than just you, you really do need money to, to prove your, your initial thesis, right? And so I, I think that it's, it's, it's hard because unless you're independently wealthy, you need some money to get started. And so everyone's sort of raising a little bit too early. Um, and so if you can somehow fund the first you know, 100K or use customers to fund your initial traction. I think that that's the best bet. But yeah, every, you know, it's, re it's really hard to tell someone who's sort of out of money, like you need to sell more customers. You need to meet that milestone before investors will be interested. Yeah. So change the subject a little bit. You've taken on a, a interesting side hustle, I'll call it. Like you're, you're currently like a homeschool teacher for your, for your daughter <laughs> teaching business. I think it's so interesting, so neat. Like, the basic teams of basis how to build a business correct yeah so so i used to run an incubator really early when we started our accounting firm um you know i i didn't have a lot of clients and so i thought well in this in the spare time i'll do a pay-to-play incubator sort of like founders institute right and um and i still have all the documentation the incubator doesn't exist anymore um it was sort of a partnership with a company they'd sold it you know and i think that company had sold it or folded but i had all the content for uh, running a, a startup incubator. And it was a 12 week program um, that you met twice a week. And so I thought, you know, 12 weeks sounds like, um, sounds like school, right? It sounds like a quarter. And uh, when, when the pandemic started and everyone was homeschooling, uh, my wife complained, Andrew, you know, I'm, I'm doing all the English, all the math, you're not doing anything for homeschooling. And I said, well, although I'm an accountant, uh, I use a uh, calculator due to the math. So probably not the best on uh, math theory. And, and because I'm an accountant, I'm not super great at writing and my, my uh, penmanship's pretty, pretty crappy. And so I thought, what could I teach my daughter who's eight years old um, that would help her in life, right? And get my wife off my back to some extent. And so what I did with my daughter is we essentially went through the incubator content. And so it was, it was fun going through with her and talking to her about her interests and what she likes and teaching her the product validation process. And so, you know, one of our classes, what we did was we called all the grandparents and we asked them about what their problems were. And so, you know, for example, um, my mother-in-law, uh, she complained that when she was uh, going to the store uh, in the summer to plant her vegetable garden and her flower garden, it was really hard to lift, you know, cause she was getting older. It was really hard to lift all of the all of the dirt and so we essentially validated a company that would uh elderly people could order online and have the the dirt and the seeds shipped to their home in packages that were you know self-selected and small enough that elderly people could could pick them up and move them and and weren't the big huge 50 pound home depot bags so um you know it, it's just been a fun experience of uh daddy daughter um you know starting a business together. So that's, that's nice. When you first told her this voice, like, I don't want to learn your job, daddy. Like, what are you doing? Like, or was it like, how was that? Going? Yeah. You know, it, it, it's interesting. So yeah, of course she doesn't want to be an accountant. <laughs> yeah. Like you said, no young kids are saying, geez, I really want to be an accountant, but you know, I, I think that we're going into it and I, I, 
I said to her, I said, you know, I, her, her mother's really pushed her to be a doctor. So I said, I know you want to be a doctor, but if you're a doctor, you might own a doctor's practice. So it'd be great to understand the fundamentals of business. And so I think that when you go through it um, with a child and you talk about their interests and you have them validate with people, the customer validation asking, hey, what's your problem? Is there some solution that would solve it? And then trying to work around a business around a solution they're interested in. I think that it really um, is attractive to young kids and they, they really get behind it. Andrew, you do a lot to give a, a back to entrepreneurs and startup communities. And we'll talk about some more in detail. But right now, we'll talk about your, your meetup called Cigar and Startups. Can you <laughs> talk about how that started, what's going on with it, and the changes you had to do because of COVID? Yeah, so, it, so it's interesting about, um, before I started my accounting firm, I was working at an angel investment group. And I, I was the executive vice president. So I wasn't an investor per se, but I sort of represented the interests of the investors. And what I really struggled with is that these angel investment groups um, were really toxic, I felt like, to entrepreneurs. And as the executive vice president and the person bringing in the entrepreneurs and telling them, hey, this is a great forum to pitch investors, and then the investors poking fun at them or tearing up their pitch if they didn't have enough traction, I, d I just felt like it was, uh, was not the best way to meet investors. I felt like a more casual environment would be better. And so... With Cigars and Startups, it was sort of the anti-angel investment group. And so we welcomed entrepreneurs and investors to come and enjoy a cigar and, and whiskey and whatnot together. And uh, what we did was we in turn invited the investors to pitch the entrepreneurs. And so for the first couple of years of Cigars and Startups, the investor, all the VCs in Seattle, uh, and, and even I brought in a VC from Chicago, a couple from San Francisco, they came and pitched the entrepreneurs of what they were looking for in the ideal entrepreneur, above and beyond a great team, great traction, and great product, right? The standard. Whatever, yeah, the yeah. standard three. But I talked about something a little bit more um, humanistic, right? And so, for example, Voyager Capital, uh, Eric Benson, this is a really uh, famous Cigars and Startups everyone always talks about. Uh, Eric Benson at Voyager Capital said, we're looking for founders who aren't assholes. And everyone got a big kick out of that. But his point was that they wanted entrepreneurs that were teachable, that hired great people, that people love to love, above and beyond a great company, a great team, and whatever. They wanted to find that founder that people just wanted to follow. And then in turn, we said, well, why would we take your money, at Eric? You know, and Eric is a, is a great, he's a big guy. He, he grew up on a farm and he said, hey, you know, here at Voyager, we're not assholes. And so, you know, the, the cool thing about that is, is that's really true. The, all, all the Voyager guys, some of them will even attend Cigars and Startups, even when they're not invited to uh, be the guest speaker, because they're just down to earth guys that you want to have on your team as investors that are helpful in general. So, so how long have you do, been doing these events? Yeah, so we, um, so I, I had a friend who started Cigars and Startups in 2011. And then he got a job at Amazon and clearly didn't have time to run it. And so I picked it up in 2014. And from February of 14, up until probably the second or third month of the pandemic, I did it every single month. And then during the summer, uh, twice a month. We also expanded to New York and Austin, Texas to have chapters there as well, which Austin, I actually flied down or flew down, I guess, for a couple months to... Um, to help get that one off the ground. When the pandemic happened, uh, we moved to Zoom for a couple of the, the meetings. But the hard thing with Zoom is you sort of have to sit around and wait for the next guy to finish talking before you can talk. And so we haven't done one for a couple months. Um, but what we're working on is, is there a solution, a tech solution online? And if someone has it, uh, message me on Instagram, maybe. Um, but is there a tech solution that feels more like an in-person event uh, where maybe your Zoom screen is walking up to another Zoom screen and the audio gets louder or quieter? And so you can have more group discussions all in the same event, but not have to wait for the next person to finish talking. So what's your favorite bourbon or whiskey? Do you, you have a go-to? <laughs> you know, I, um, I really like Knob Creek. Okay. Because I feel like Knob Creek puts hair on your chest because it's got that really boldness to it. But it's also smooth and the hangover is not too bad <laughs> if you have a few too many. So I, I think I think Knob Creek is a, is a really great bourbon. It's a little bit stronger than some of the others, but it has some of that soft subtlety. I think on the other sides of it, you know, you've got the plain Jim Beam, which I think is a little too rough. 
and you got Basil Hayden on the other side, which I think is a little too light. So I feel like Knob Creek is the Goldilocks of uh, of bourbons. And the Scar Startups, but you, you, you do this in Bellevue, but I think you change the location as everyone saw too, correct? Yeah, so in, in Seattle, we would do it uh, at a bar in Ballard um, because they had a huge outside patio and it was totally covered. And so, and they have heat lamps and or fire pits and heat lamps. And so we could do that year round in that location. And we did that the last Wednesday of every month uh, up until you know, it became illegal to meet other people in person. Yeah. Uh, and then um, the one in Bellevue, um, we done at the Sweet Lounge, which was a bar at the Bellevue Square out on their patio. And then when I got an office at WeWork in Bellevue, we'd done them on my uh, rooftop deck as well. So Andrew, here in Seattle, there's all these like, I'll, I'll call them like startup channels, right? There's Founders Live, Startup Grind, Founders Institute, Seattle Angel Conference. I mean, on and on and on. But do all these groups actually collaborate and help each other out, or are they just strictly siloed? What do you, what do you, what's your opinion on that? Yeah, so I'm in an interesting position because I'm working to help all startups and accounting services, especially at the price points that we are. And you can send your viewers to our website where we're, uh, I wouldn't say we're cheap, but we're, we're definitely cost effective for an entrepreneur who's starting a business to, to do that. And so, uh, Seattle Angel Conference were a sponsor. I actually do the accounting for the Seattle Angel Conference as well. Uh, Founders Live, I'm really close to Nick Hughes. I, uh, I joke with Nick Hughes every time I grab beers with him that we should start a venture capital firm. He brings in the deals I analyze them. <laughs> um, if only we had more money. Um, you know, and I think that it, in general, the, the founders of those groups are pretty friendly with each other. And I don't feel like it's a competitive scenario. Um, but I do feel like there's been, I mean, with the pandemic, it's been a lot harder, but, you know, once we can get back to meeting in person, there's so many resources. And I don't think it's just Seattle. Um, when we moved down to start the cigars and startups in Austin, Texas, uh, they had all the, all these same similar things. They have the Capital Factory in Austin, Texas was a great sort of center of gravity. Techstars has a big presence there. You know, all these cities have you know, a million cups. Um, there's a million cups in Tacoma too that I've attended their events. I just feel like everyone is in the startup community is really trying to help each other win. Yes. So Andrew, let's talk about your current company right now, Z Z Counting. Yeah. Can you talk about how we got started, the vision and what you're doing for it? Before, I, before that, you said you do a small business. So the small business administration definition of small, small business is 500 employees or less, which to me is not really a small business. <laughs> what's, what's your definition of small business? Yeah, you know, it's it's funny. My wife works for one of the largest, I, I mean, maybe even the largest law firm in Seattle. So she calls the companies I work with embryonic businesses, <laughs> right? So our largest uh, client that we work with um, probably does 30 million a year in sales. And they've got a lot of contractors, but probably only 20 or 30 uh, employees. And, uh, and so that's sort of the top side of our, of our companies. We have um, on the small side, uh, we have some people that are just a sole proprietor business that hire us to host their QuickBooks. So one of the things that we do that Intuit uh, doesn't like, that QuickBooks doesn't like is I get a discount of 50% off of the QuickBooks subscription. And so when I sign up a client, I just pass on that discount to them to be supportive to the startup community. Um, especially if they're, they're working with me. And so I, I think, I think I host your QuickBooks too, yes, you, do. Yes, you, you know? Do, yeah. And so, um, you know, we, we, uh, we have very small businesses up to, you know, profitable, you know, tens of millions of dollars a year businesses. But back to your original question, how did Z counting get started? And uh, I think, you know, the first thing I did was I started cigars and startups because I felt like the entrepreneurship community really needed a, uh, a place to relax and, and connect. But the other thing that I really struggled with at an angel investment uh, company or angel investment group was that the entrepreneurs really couldn't explain how they're going to return money to investors. And many times investors were investing because other investors were investing, not because they had a clear path to getting a return on their investment. And so when you're just following other investors and you're losing money and companies are folding, it's really hard for you to analyze a deal that will get a return for your capital. And so my thought was, if I leave this angel group with the network that I have, and I can go do CFO work and help entrepreneurs explain their business to investors better from a financial perspective, 
way more deals that get done in Seattle and the other cities where we, where we work with companies. What it turned out is that the CFO business is fine, but it's, it's sort of uh, up and down. And once you get funded, you know, the startups start looking for something cheaper, right? And so what I realized that if you help startups early on create a good foundation and help the entrepreneurs understand their financials and their business from day one or day 10 or, you know, <laughs> month 10, <laughs> you know, then when they start talking to investors, they know what happened last month with their financials. They know what happened last year with their financials. And you can optimize all of these tax uh, things to help grow the business. And so today I, I still do some CFO work for some of my original clients that started, you know, six, seven years ago. But for the most part, our team is focused on back office management of the accounting, the bookkeeping, the bill pay, the invoicing and stuff like that. So Andrew, for what you're doing, you know, you have to be trustworthy and you already answered a little bit, but how do you convince potential clients or customers that you're trustworthy and that, you, that they can trust you with their numbers? Yeah, you know, it's, it's really tough. And we get inquiries from marketing firms all the time that say, hey, can we spam your LinkedIn, right? And I, and I have to tell them, you know, an accounting business is not a business where you can just spam someone and they're going to sign up because it is a trust business. And so what I, what I do is I try and support the communities that we work in and support entrepreneurs in general and take opportunities where I can be an expert in an accounting topic and use that to show that I'm trustworthy. Also, once we close the client, there's a lot of internal things that we do to create internal controls around the accounting and the books. Cause you know, with a company as big as ours, I'm clearly not the person doing all the books and you probably wouldn't want me to be right. But uh, you know, we've got a, we got a team of bookkeepers um, here in Bellevue, Washington. Um, and we're actually looking for one in Salt Lake city and one in Austin, Texas, if any uh, bookkeepers out there uh, are, are interested, but we, um, we, we put through controls, like we don't take bank access. So if you're a client of ours, we don't need to have access to your bank account. Um, we also like the tool bill.com. So in bill.com, uh, we can, you can set up permissions. So we can create the invoice and then the client um, has to pay that invoice. They have to push a, approve, right? And then throughout all of our processes, we build in approvals and review processes to help prevent errors. I, I would rather call them errors than, than fraud or errors or mistakes. You know, we, we put that stuff in to help um, build that trust with the founders and, and be very responsive. Andrew, what's your process for finding new bookkeepers? I mean, I'm sure you just can't take some random person on the street. Just has to be some kind of process that you go through to make sure they're, you make sure you validate them, make sure they'll be a match for you, right? How do you go about doing that? Yeah. So what, what's been really um, interesting for our business, uh, one of the things that I did when my Wife had our son a couple of years back. Um, she really wanted to work from home, but big law firms, it's hard to do that. And they really want to see FaceTime. And so I thought, you know, the great thing about starting your own business is you can kind of define the company culture and what it's going to be. And so I said, I want to support people that have various interests beyond work, right? You know, so as, as important as work is and as entrepreneurs, pretty much our work is our life. But, you know, some people don't think that way, right? They, they want to, go out and climb the mountains on the weekend or, you know, spend time with their kids and family. And so one of the things that I, that I thought was, I want to create a flexible workplace that allows people to work from home and supports moms that want to go to a PTA meeting. And so I pretty much put a, a Craigslist ad up that said, I'm looking for a stay at home mom that wants to do a couple hours of accounting during the week when their kids are at school. Right. And uh, I got more than enough inquiries of people that responded to that. And my wife said, oh, you shouldn't say that because then you're, you're, you know, being sexist and you're being, you know, whatever. But, um, you know, we, we target people that have a passion, but also have an understanding of, of accounting. And so we've got a lot of, a lot of our bookkeeping managers are mothers that worked in big accounting firms before that wanted a, a lighter pace of life. Um, so they can work and, and that wanted the flexibility to work after hours. So our newest hire, um, Aaron was telling me, gee, you know, Andrew, I've, I've worked till, uh, you know, one o'clock last night. I said, well, geez, Aaron, you shouldn't be working so late. She goes, no, it's awesome because I can put the kids to bed at eight work from nine to one on, on my work for you. 
And then I can get up with the kids at 9 a.m. and spend the whole day with the kids. And I really appreciate the flexibility that you give us to, to do it. And for the clients, the clients love it too, because the clients are getting an email at 10 o'clock at night, just paid this bill. And they think that our team is working 24 <laughs> hours a day. You know, it's so it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's great all around. So Andrew, talk about this buck acronym that you use. How did that come about? What's the history? What's the background on that? So I am a big fan of Amazon Alexa. Right. I have Alexa's all throughout my house. It drives my wife crazy. My daughter calls Alexa my girlfriend. Right. Um, and so so I'm a big fan of the voice assistants. And uh, and I'm I've got fat fingers. Uh, so so typing on a cell phone just really doesn't work that well for me. So being able to use the voice assistants is great. And I thought, wouldn't it be great if there was a voice assistant that could help people do accounting? Right. And so maybe someday I'll start this tech company that does that. But in the meantime, I was telling my wife, oh, wouldn't it be great if, you know, you had a bookkeeping assistant, right? And my wife goes, well, you better not make it a woman because Siri's a woman, <laughs> Amazon's a woman, whatever. And so I was like, yeah, but if you asked a guy, no one would ever think that he's actually doing it. Right? <laughs> and so uh, I was brainstorming over a couple glasses of whiskey with a couple marketing friends. And uh, we were thinking about GitHub's OctoCat, right? Wouldn't it be fun if you had something like the OctoCat? And one thing led to another and Buck was born, right? And so we had all these puns about saving a buck, you know, the buck stops here, et cetera. And so Buck became our bookkeeping assistant. And so um, we've deployed a text message software and I, I know I've you've used, used it, it yeah, before. Yeah. And so you can literally from your phone while you're in between meetings, text the bookkeeping team, hey, was this invoice paid? Hey, can you send an invoice to this customer? I, or uh, yeah, can you send an invoice to this customer I just met with, you know, I told them I get it to them by end of day, you know, and then they can respond to it. And when you're texting Buck, it's texting the whole bookkeeping team. So if your direct bookkeeper is going to a PTA meeting, for example, um, one of the other bookkeepers can jump in and help. So. So Andrew, why is it important for founders to get the finances right? And why does it seem so many founders like push this off or don't pay attention or at least not enough attention as they should to it? Yeah. You know, I, a lot of people say like, do I really need to do accounting or and what I tell them is if, if you go to the bank and you stick your ATM card in and you're never worried about the dollar amount that you pull out bouncing, right? Like you just know every time I put it in, money is going to come out, right? I'd say don't do bookkeeping, right? Send your year end. Here's all the revenue. Here's all the money in. Here's all the money out to your tax preparer and they'll file your tax return, right? But if you ever had that thought, like, Ooh, I don't know how much I can pull out right now, right? That's the reason you need bookkeeping, right? And you need to do your accounting. And I think that as a founder, you're responsible for the investor's money that they've given confidence to you to manage for them, to give them a return. And so, especially after you've taken investor money, and I think the, the most important investor money that you take is your own money, you should really be worried about that money being spent correctly and effectively and and appropriately right and so if you're not doing your bookkeeping it's very hard to track that and it's a very tenuous uh, arduous process to create the excel spreadsheets and to review every bank transaction and so working and i think you've experienced working with a firm like us a lot of the menial stuff is done by the bookkeeping team buck does all the transactions and so really when you're in there you're seeing the results of that and you can track your business and, and track it on a monthly, weekly basis. Andrew, what is financial modeling and when should entrepreneurs start doing financial modeling? Yeah, I think that you should start a financial model anytime that you're making an investment. So even coming out of the gate, you should think, what are the costs that are going to go into this before I get to revenue? And once I get revenue, where should I invest that money? And so financial modeling is just essentially the, the future of bookkeeping. <laughs> So bookkeeping tracks what happened in the past. Financial modeling is essentially forecasting that forward. And then talk about the importance of due diligence for startup entrepreneurs once they start fundraising and how, how should you get ready for that? Yeah, so due diligence is the process in which an investor will do their due diligence to review your books and your records and such um, to, to see whether or not they should trust you with their money. And so I think that if you can start due diligence when you start your company, start building your due diligence package, then it'll be the easiest and best way for you to get through a clean due diligence. So in due diligence, you'll have all the pertinent financial information. 
you'll have your marketing information, your big wins, all your legal documentation. And so I tell entrepreneurs, when you start your company, create a little Dropbox folder or Google Drive, and then drop in every legal document under a legal folder, every accounting document under an accounting folder, every tax document under a tax folder. And then if you put this stuff together, when an investor wants to review your your company and, and whether or not you did things correct, they're all in one place. And from your experience of past, what are some like um, red flags you've seen investors say, well, no, I'm not gonna invest in this person because something came up with due diligence, just lack of money control or maybe a character flaw? Or... I mean, I, I think that investors are looking to invest in entrepreneurs that look like entrepreneurs that have made them money before. And so I think the, the biggest sort of gaffe that I saw, especially running the angel investment uh, company, was that an investor would say, hey, I'm ready to do due diligence. Can you share with me your due diligence folder? And the entrepreneur was like, well, what do you want in that folder, right? And the oh, investor makes, them look, like, makes them look like a rookie. Yeah, it makes right? them look like they haven't, they haven't prepared their stuff. Or, you know, when the investor says, can you send me financials? They're like, what format do you want financials in, <laughs> right? <laughs> the standard format, dude, just send me the financials out of QuickBooks, right? And so I think that having all of your documentation in an organized way, and even if you're not using QuickBooks, if, if, you're, if your accounting is done in Excel, but it's very clear and well laid out, which takes a lot of work and a lot of time, I think the investors should be happy with that, right? But it just, you have to show the investors that you're thoughtful about what you've done with your own money first, that you haven't been careless, that you've met milestones and that you're trustworthy to take their money. And I have to think if, if someone, there's two, two uh, entrepreneurs, one says, well, here's my Excel spreadsheet. And then another one has like worked with someone like you and you forward it to them. I think it has to give them extra bonus points. Okay, this entrepreneur is smart to have an accountant doing this for them, right? Yeah, the other benefit that we give is um, I used to help entrepreneurs do fundraising. So I'd help them meet investors and do the pitch deck and stuff like that. Um, but what I found out is, now that we've got you know, 150, 200 clients, um, we're a real you know, accounting firm that investors, you know, we get a lot of referrals from investors. And wh what I do in turn to thank them for those referrals is I bubble up companies I think investors would be interested in investing in. And so when I'm able to tell an investor, hey, look, there's a guy who thought that m money and managing money well was important enough to hire us and he's going to be out looking for money and we've done his books to date and I'm not going to send you garbage. The investor takes that meeting and meets with the entrepreneur and in a lot of cases will invest. And so I think working with the firm like us shows you're serious about the books. You're compliant with all of the tax laws and, and all of the things that you need to be compliant with and gives the investors confidence that you care about the numbers, which is all the investors should really be interested in. And you're headquartered in Bellevue, but you're nationwide, correct? Yeah, so we're, we're headquartered in Bellevue, um, which right now due to the pandemic is just me. Um, but we also have a uh, office that's um, in the last quarter had opened. We had a lot of clients in Austin, Texas. And so we've got a, uh, another sales guy down in Austin, Texas, and we're probably going to add a bookkeeper down there too. So we'll have a, a small office, you know, like a WeWork office or something um, down in Austin, Texas. And then we're planning on um, expanding to Denver as well. So in Seattle, you're pretty well known in the Seattle startup area, small business area. How do you mark yourself to these other communities where you're, where you're not where you're not there? Yeah, you know, cigars and startups has been a great way to way to do that. Also through the TechStars network. Uh, like I said, the TechStars network is the most valuable. Um, also, we do really good work, and so we get a lot of referrals. Our best uh, marketing is really our current clients sending us you know, their friends and, and other entrepreneurs that they know. But yeah, anywhere that we go, we try and give back and help entrepreneurs um, in every city that we're in. So we talked about startups in Seattle before. So the Bay Area, Silicon Valley is like the Mecca, right? VC, startups, whatever. And I think in a way, Seattle tries to get there, right? But is that, should, be, should that even be a goal for Seattle to try to be the Bay Area or should we just try to be the best Seattle we can be? Yeah, you know, what's interesting is... Uh, the Bay Area has really become the center of gravity for tech. You know, they get tenfold the, the venture capital dollars than any other city in, in the country. And Seattle's in the top three, probably. Um, but if you look at the companies, uh, the largest companies in the world, two of those are based in Seattle, right? You know, Microsoft and Amazon. And 
And if you look at the entrepreneurs, our most famous entrepreneurs out of Seattle, um, they built really giantly huge companies, which does a poor job of creating um, uh, sort of recycled funds into the startup ecosystem. And so I think the real difference between Seattle and San Francisco is in, in San Francisco, there were a lot of investors that had small wins that doubled down on their wins early on that created other small wins that doubled down on their wins. Whereas it, as in Seattle, all of our wins are just huge, right? And the founder tends to run the company until the, the company exits. So for example, uh, Concur, um, the same founders ran that company for 20 or 30 years until SAP purchased them just a couple of years ago, right? And, you know, Bill Gates is still involved with Microsoft, even though not on a daily basis, but the founder of Microsoft and Amazon.com, clearly Jeff is still running Amazon. And so when you have entrepreneurs like that are growing these giant companies, they can't afford to invest in startups because they just have so much, a, a 10X win of 100K isn't material to those guys. You know? yeah. So in your experience and what you've seen in the past, what do successful entrepreneurs consistently do right? And what are unsuccessful entrepreneurs consistently doing wrong? Yeah, I think that if, if you can find a way to get customers to pay you up front, I think that it makes a lot of entrepreneurship a lot easier to do. Because if a customer's paying you up front, they clearly want your product. And then you have the funding to make it happen. Um, the other thing I'd suggest is, is don't be afraid to build a team of people around you to help you be successful. And so the founders that are able to convince people to follow them before they have enough funding to hire them and get people to sort of work for free to be part of something that's inspiring, those inspiring founders, I think, do really well. And then one, if you can be inspiring to people and you can have customer demand, um, then I think the third thing is making sure you're not getting in trouble with the IRS or Washington State or, you know, the state that you live in or payroll taxes and stuff like that. Because... There's been a couple of founders where we've met them and then two or three years later, because they've convinced people to work with them for free, because they had customers that wanted their product, they still existed. And they got to a point where the IRS was chomping down on their necks because they'd never paid payroll taxes, you know, or they hadn't filed their tax returns for three or four years. And they have a government contract that requires them to be compliant with the IRS. And so they weren't able to deliver on those contracts. And at, at that point, having to clean up that business, we've we've done it before, but it tends to be significantly more expensive than it would have been had they been doing it all along. So I'm going to believe that all customers are not good customers. <laughs> have you ever had a disqualified customer? And what, what, what's your process for that if you had to do that in the past? Yeah, so if you're losing money on a customer, uh, there's very few reasons to keep that customer. And so I think in our business, if we had a client that was calling us every single day, wasting the time of our bookkeepers, um, not asking dumb questions, but asking unnecessary questions. And, you know, we we're burning hours and hours and hours for, you know, $500 a month. Um, we, we should probably look at, at terminating that customer. There have been times that we've had uh, mismatches in, in expectations and understandings. And in those cases, we try and work to find a win and the most graceful way to exit. And so, for example, a really close friend of mine hired us to help set up his company and to do his bookkeeping. Um, however, this friend of mine happened to be very high maintenance and he wanted answers instantaneously. And we're just not really set up for answers instantaneously. You know, we do 24 hour turnaround and we respond to emails, but he really wanted to drop a thing on someone's desk and have it back in five minutes. And so what I did was I, I helped him uh, find another person, interview that person, and transfer all of our process documentation to that person so that he could be successful meeting his expectations with someone who was, who was uh, able and willing to do that. So, Andrew, you know, it's out there, you know, if you're an entrepreneur, keep grinding, keep going, you know, don't give up, don't quit, you know, find a way to make it work. But is there ever a time when an entrepreneur should say, you know what, this isn't working out, like, not a pivot, but this is not working for me. When you start entrepreneurs say, you know what, let me like stop and start all over again. Yeah, I think that the customer should start out doing product market fit conversations with their customers and figure out whether or not it's a viable business 
And they should constantly go back and evaluate whether or not the customers are being successful and growing. And so, you know, there's, there's a common sort of push for grind it out. You got to do it. You got, you know, you got to make progress, but if you don't have the customer interest and customers just don't want your product, you should consider pivoting or shutting it down. Um, I don't know. I think it's different for every person. I had a client um, who since sort of graduated out, but uh, he was a high net worth individual that really thought that we should have electric boats. Right. And uh, he wanted to essentially build the Tesla of boats and he put in millions of dollars of his own money for years and years and years to get to a point where he could create an electric boat. And the first electric engine that they were able to create for a boat was really like a puttery boat for like a, you know, it wasn't the high performance boat that he wanted, you know? And so some people could say, well, you've spent, you know, a million dollars to build this, you know, unsuccessful little boat. Maybe you should give up. But, you know, in his case, his mission was so important to him that he did whatever it takes. And it, he ended up raising a ton of money and, and, uh, and growing that to be a real, you know, a real company today um, where, you know, and I had another client who, um, who had a really great patent portfolio, but they really struggled to get product market fit and they struggled to get people to buy their app and to get them to onboard. And people didn't really understand how to use their product. And he really grinded for a couple of years. Um, but I think that he didn't really take a step back and find out why is the customers aren't buying this product and what can we do to make it more attractive to customers? And so he ultimately shut down the business and got rid of it. And I think that was also a good decision. But I think it's on a per per person basis. And, and I mean, it has to be a tough decision, right? I mean, it's been your baby, it's been your life for two, three years. So you know, make the decision. I'm gonna shut this down. I mean, that has to be heart wrenching. It's like a gut wrenching. Well, I can, I can give a personal example. So I used to have a crate business called Mobata, <laughs> right? And we were doing a million dollars a year. So for all intents and purposes, it was a successful business, right? Especially as a 22 year old. But when the housing crisis happened and the bottom fell out of the market, um, we just weren't making ends meet. And so I ran that business for another three or four years until I was totally tapped out on saving and ended up having to close all operations. But for me, I didn't want to have that big F on my shirt, right? I didn't want to have the failure of a business uh, sort of haunting me. So if you see my website still up and, and, I, and I still maintain the business license because I just felt like, you know, it was a successful business and in my heart, it still carries on. And so, um, so that, that's what I did, but there, there was a point where just, I couldn't afford to keep, um, running that business. And I had so many better business opportunities to do tech startups and, you know, now have an accounting firm and, and all those other things. So Andrew, one thing I really like about you, you always give back to the community. I don't remember the time frame, but once COVID hit and the PPE loans came out, you, you really did something great for the entrepreneur community. Can you talk about that? Yeah. So I mean, this sort of relates back to the, the housing crisis in, in 2007, because I had a crate business. And when the housing market crashed and the financial markets crashed, they give a bailout to the banks and all the small businesses like me kind of never recovered. Right. And so we got from 2007 till 2011, when I ended up closing, uh, I was devastated. I lost everything I had. Right. And so what happened when this crisis hit and all of businesses were forced shut down and the markets dropped due to COVID, I was in a position where I remembered what happened when, when things got hard. And so I, I built up a savings account and my wife had a job and, you know, she got a, a deduction of her pay, but she was still getting paid. And so I just felt like I was in a position uh, where I was going to be okay. Right. And a lot of the founders I was working with, I wasn't, you know, seeing the numbers, I wasn't sure that they would. And so one of the things that, that we did is any of our customers that called us and said, hey, like, we really can't afford to do this. We said, hey, we'll tell you what, if you can't afford to pay, don't pay your invoice, but we're going to keep doing the work because this is the time you need accounting the most. And then when all the government programs came out, we helped all of our customers get the PPP loans and the EIDL loans. And a lot of them were saying, hey, I have a friend, would you help them? And and some of them were asking me, what would you charge for this? And I said, you know what? I, uh, I don't feel like I can charge these, these clients 
because the small businesses are just hurting so bad. And so we filed probably 200 PPP loans for free to any entrepreneur that, that needed help doing it. And so we expanded a ton of customers in, in Los Angeles, in Oakland, um, Austin, Texas, um, other areas of the country, because, you know, a lot of people just weren't providing help to these businesses and the government wasn't doing a great job of providing that help either. And, and I was in a position to do it. So we helped. Yeah. Like I said, we helped for free 200 businesses file these, file these things. Do you happen to know the success rate or the approval rate for those loans that y'all did? I, I mean, every loan that we did, we got, we got approved in okay. some way for some amount, you know, we had a, um, a caterer in, in Los Angeles who, I'd met him. I was at a party that he was catering at. You know, I gave him my number because he'd mentioned he'd never done his taxes before, <laughs> right? And so, so that guy, I had encouraged him to do his taxes last year. So he'd actually filed his tax return. But his problem is he'd never hired his employees as W-2 employees. And so he was always paying people sort of under the counter or sort of in sort of the gray area. And so for him, he should have gotten half a million dollars of of PPP money had all of his employees been W-2 employees. And we were able to negotiate with a bank to get him $200,000 to hire those people that he'd previously been hiring as contractors, as employees, and just to pivot his business into doing, you know, delivery opposed to full catering and stuff like that. And so that's an example where uh, he wasn't able to get that on his, on his own. And he really needed someone to put things together in a way that the banks recognized it and, and realized it and, and were able to get through. I had to imagine that was pretty time intensive for you and your company, 200 loans. That sort of, I'm, sure, I'm pretty sure it was a <laughs> yeah, short time it, period. Only too, a couple right? months. Yeah. You know, some of them, if all the information, like for our clients, it was a five minute process because we had the payroll records. We had their tax return. It was really easy to file those for our existing clients. But yeah, what I do is I create a checklist of, hey, if you have these things, give them to me. If you have a payroll system, let's log in together. And we were able to put that together. So in general, going through the loan process only took five or 10 minutes. There were the few, though, that we really had to rebuild records and create records that helped them get through. But I just felt like, you know, particularly this caterer that was previously doing a million, you know, over a million dollars a year in catering and events. Um, the, I just felt my heart went out to him because he never had someone that said, you need to go file your taxes, right? Or you should file payroll taxes. You know, no one had ever told him to do that. And, and he was sort of left behind by all the government programs, you know, that were really, I don't think that small businesses were the target of the PPP loan. I really think it was those 500 or less. Yeah. They said small companies. business. I know, I know some frustrated people like, like small business was struggling, like, what, this is kind of complicated we're doing. And then like you hear about what I think Steak and Shake got it, you know. 20 million, yeah. The Los Angeles, Los Angeles Lakers got it. Like, how does the Los Angeles Lakers get a PPE loan? <laughs> yeah. Like, are you kidding me right now? Exactly. Well, you know, and they're, they're saying that a lot of these foundations, the private foundations for billionaires and millionaires were taking PPP loans. Yeah, I heard that and, too. And I, and I just think like, I mean, I validated for all the clients that, that we did that they genuinely needed the money to survive. Right. And so I just don't know how you can apply for that loan and not read that portion because it's pretty and, loud. And, and, then, clear. and then what type of person are you, right? You're like, you're a multi-million dollar business. You're go well off and you take this loan meant for a small business. I, I don't know how people look, look this up in the mirror, you know, but it's just me. Yeah. If, you know, if you don't have, you know, and I, I've always told people, you know, keep three to six months of reserves in case something happens. And so, I mean, a lot of people, I guess, don't have any reserves that, that they needed this, but you know, it's, um, I, I think it's a lesson to everyone, you know, if you do everything right and, and create your processes, because it's, it's really easy to get the participate in these programs, if you have all of your ducks in a row. Um, and then yeah, do the right thing, because there's someone else that's struggling a lot more than you are. Here's a question for you, Andrew. So COVID is bad, you know, a lot of people get a part of business. And there's always these program helps small business out. However, common is that a good thing for the economy, right? Like, it's like, suppose you're, you're, there's a business out there, they have poor customer service, they don't take care of customers, they're barely making it, and COVID comes around and puts them out. So do we really rebuild this company out? Yeah, I think that's a real tough question. I think that um, the hard thing for me 
Um, and, you know, I, I like to go up to the mountains and sort of visit rural communities and, and experience freedom every once in a while from our, uh, from our uh, King County, Seattle, like really extremist um, uh, communist government here. But, you know, I think that some of these businesses that are, that are really struggling are really important. Right. And so should the government be picking and choosing which businesses survive or not? Like, Oh, you're a shitty business with bad customer service. You shouldn't get a PP. Well, and I don't think that that's the government's choice, but I think that forcing businesses to close for, you know, whether it was political or not, or whether it's, you know, I think there's a genuine pandemic and COVID is a genuine disease that's hurting a lot of people. And clearly the numbers are going up and deaths are going up. But I think that forcing businesses to close and not providing them any aid to support their families. And I think particularly here in Washington, closing the week before Thanksgiving, when it felt like all the restaurants had set up processes to, to be safe. I just, my heart went out to the, the restaurant workers and their families who now aren't able to buy Christmas presents or even pay their rent. It doesn't seem like it's uh, tailored like a specific business type, doesn't it? Yeah. I, I just, I just think that there, there should, there needs to be more help to small businesses if the government's going to interfere in business this far. Um, so, you, you know, yeah. In your accounting eight ball, what do you want to call it? Do you see another PP loan coming down the pipeline? Do you see like, like more help coming on? Like the what, like check they gave to everyone, like $12 each family or something. Do you see anything like coming in the future or? Yeah. So they're right now they're, they're supposedly, I mean, maybe as of now, maybe they've already passed it, but they, they should be passing another program. And a lot of the local governments um, have started to set up programs here in Seattle. I think there's a $20 million grant program, which I think if you calculate it's $250 to each small business, but you know, there's a lot of local programs and local organizations that, that are helping people. I do think that they need to do something else like the PPP loan. Um, and I, and I think that a forgivable loan would be, would be great because a lot of, a lot of the entrepreneurs, you know, we were told, um, that we're going to do a two week lockdown here in Washington state. Right. And, and this is now 10 months later, we're still locked down. And so I think that a lot of these decisions that we made when taking the first PPP loan of saying, Hey, this is just a couple weeks, you know, maybe the next two months and then things are going to be back open. I think that those loans should have matched the actual reality of the severity of, of the virus and the severity of the politicians um, not having an understanding of the struggles of small business. So of course, like, you know, no one can plan for something like this. Is anything business could have done, you know, like 20, like 2019 to prepare for this? I'm thinking that says no, because. Yeah. I, I just think if, um, you know, I encourage entrepreneurs to have uh a no shit fund or, or to have some reserves, um, you know, three, six months of payroll so that they can at least keep their employees employed while they figure it out. But I would also encourage entrepreneurs to have a culture of innovation um, and an ability to pivot. And so, um, you know, we have a client who is an event company, you know, it sounds, we've got a couple of event companies, but one in particular, um, they're an event company and they pivoted, you know, they, they came to me right when this happened. Hey, we're an event company. They're shutting down events. And they were one of the guys that I was like, well, you know, we'll still help you. And here's the loan program so we can help you get, right? And, um, and they've really pivoted into digital events in a super hard way. And, and they're now probably more successful than they were before um, the pandemic started because they, they, took, they took advantage of the, they took the lemons and turned it into, um, margaritas or whatever, right? <laughs> so, you know, they, um, they, I, I think that if a business is nimble enough to pivot, that's great. There's some businesses that can't do that. So we have a massage therapy business and it's been really tough for massage therapists to be able to, to do their business. Yeah. It's kind of hard to social distance to do a massage, right? Ex- exactly. Yeah. Unless, Six, unless like Andrew, Rub, rub your arm on your leg. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. Like yeah, rub your arm on your. Yeah, exactly. Or uh, you know, twist to the <laughs> left and rub that. You know, put that rock underneath your tush. Um, no, so so her business was totally devastated, but she was able to use um, some of the government funding 
um, to buy into uh, uh, sort of a mini Airbnb mm-hmm. hotel on uh, Vashon Island, the Burton Inn. And so she was able to essentially pivot her business to doing outdoor massage at this hotel on uh, on Vashon Island, which uh, which was pretty cool. So I think she's doing better now than she was before because she's now got Airbnb revenue. She's got you know food revenue from the kitchen downstairs, and she's doing um, the the only type of massage that's allowed, which is uh, essentially outdoor massage. I mean, COVID is bad, but like you said, a lot of innovative, innovative people have been coming up with innovative solutions and they're like doing different things. I think a lot of people realize too, like back in the last great recession, 2008, you know, Instagram, all these great companies come up. So I'm interested to see what kind of great companies come up out of this. Like we'll be talking about five, six, seven years from now, right? Yeah, I sure, I sure hope so. Yeah. You know, and, and being stuck at home and having a lot of free time, I think that a lot of these tech workers um, are going to come up with some great ideas. You know, the other thing is the way that we work, I hate to say it, but the way that we work, I think has changed. And so uh, for for my business, we've been doing a ton of uh, discounting and promotions to help companies get through. But I think that it shows people that didn't believe in outsourcing before that people can work from home and a firm like our accounting firm can really replace those in-person people that you had before in a lot more cost-effective way. Let me get your opinion on this, right? Because like remote work, but first of all, remote work, no one say remote work, like no one say remote work, babysit, take care of your kids, cook, blah, blah, blah. Like it's, everyone's like more than remote work. So that's one thing. But I suppose they coming out there, everyone had to go to remote work, right? And then the COVID just disappears and I, by miracle, right? And this company says, okay, 50 people come back to this building. I just think people are going to say, well, hold on, wait a minute. We've proven we can work more productively from home, but now you want me to drive two hours, one away, to your job, to the job, be in a cubicle, like we're not going to do it, right? But, but then again, the employees might, the employees might say, well, well there's all the unemployed people, or oh, I'll just replace you. So I think there's an interesting dynamic that might come up. Yeah, it's going to be really interesting. I, um, the other night I smoked an illegal cigar with other people. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, one, one of the guys there ran finance for a large law firm. And uh, particularly here in Seattle, uh, he said that they're looking at after the pandemic's over um, reducing their office space because they've tried to get out of a lot of leases recently, but reducing their office space and giving a bonus for people that were willing to work from home and not uh, essentially incur the costs of in physical working. And so I think that some of these innovative companies, particularly tech companies, are going to help set up better virtual environments which I think will be amazing for the rural areas because I think a lot of uh, America over the past, you know, couple of decades has been left behind as we started, you know, bringing in a lot of products from China and Mexico and such that, you know, the old sawmills, if you go out to Eastern Washington, you know, we've still got apples, but there's been a lot of ver- vertical integration. There's a lot of communities that have really been left behind, but I think that those communities could have a really big uh, vibrant, renewal with these stay-at-home tech workers being able to live out in the countryside. So Andrew, let's talk about payroll for a minute. And one thing I think a lot of entrepreneurs don't realize or get wrong is like when you hire someone, you just not hire enough people. You're hiring the whole family, right? And a lot of people <laughs> don't get that, right? Like that's it's not only a person depending on your you, you like doing business, but the whole family, right? And I, I think it, it emphasized with the COVID the, the COVID gear. So you not only laid off that person, you laid off the whole family, you potentially put the whole family at risk, right? I don't think a lot of entrepreneurs think that through. Yeah, I think if you have an employed people, it's very difficult to understand that the stress of employing people, you know, what was hard for me is when I had the crepe business and I was 22 years old and the economy crashed, I really wasn't ready for the stress of not having enough money to pay people that I knew depended on, on um, our business paying them to meet their rent. And the stress of laying those people off when it was inevitable that the business was closing was incredibly difficult. And so one of the things that I did was I helped all of them get other jobs. You know, I or, you know, wrote them the best recommendations ever. They just felt like it. But, you know, something today that I, that I do is um, I had an employee who had a really tough day. She, um, you know, one of the clients wasn't, wasn't very clear and, and was, um, kind of being high maintenance, I guess. And, and the employee sort of took it personally. And I, and I talked to the employee and I said, Hey, you know, 
it's not, you know, it's not your fault. You're doing a great job. This, you know, there's other stuff going on with this founder because of the stress of COVID and whatnot. And, you know, everything's going great. And, and so I sent, um, I sent a bottle of wine, sort of a condolence, like, thanks for your hard work. Here's a bottle of <laughs> wine, you know, relax, you know, no one's going to die if your accounting isn't done. Right. You know, it's not like accounting isn't COVID. Right. And, uh, and what I also did was I knew that she had um, two daughters and so I sent a bottle of Martinelli's along with the wine. And so I said, enjoy this with your family, you know, and take a break, right? And so I think that you do have to have a comprehension of the family. You do have to understand the people you're working with and what motivates them. And I think if people can feel motivated and loved as a person and as a family, then they'll do great work for you too. And it's amazing to me how many people don't get that in this. Even 2020 by 2020, 2021, people just still don't get that right, unfortunately. Right. So let's go back to Z accounting. What's your vision for your company? Like, do you want to be like a national accounting firm? Do you want to like dominate? Like, what, what's your plan? What's your vision? Yeah, we want to dominate. <laughs> no, you know, it's, uh, there's just so many entrepreneurs across the country. And one of the awesome things that I've learned is an entrepreneur isn't just a kid who's writing software. An entrepreneur is, is anyone that wants to do something different than the nine to five W2 work. And so we've got a couple of hairstylists in uh, Austin, Texas, right? And some of those are just the funnest employees. We've got up in Everett, we've got a, a house painter. He paints houses for a living. And he's just a, the funnest guy to talk to because he also has a side business that sells crystals, right? And so, you know, it's just been so great meeting all of these people across the country uh, and helping them be successful in their business. And so if someday we had a little office, you know, two or three, five person office, in every major city, I'd be really stoked about that because we'd be making a huge impact of helping small business. And so I think for, for my business plan for next year, um, it's really all about how do I grow bigger and help more businesses? And then if I help more businesses and I'm profitable, then clearly I'll make you know more money down the road. But just my major mission is to help entrepreneurs understand their numbers better and make better decisions. So Andrew, what do you do for fun? <laughs> well, I really like to smoke cigars, right? So I'll, I'll smoke cigars with entrepreneurs. I like snow sports as well. So, um, you know, skiing, sledding. I've got two kids. I've got a two-year-old and an eight-year-old. And so um, my daughter and I have been doing a ton of rollerblading. My daughter's eight. So um, I remember I used to do rollerblading when I was probably her age. And so we've been doing a ton of rollerblading together which is cool. And then my two-year-old, he's finally figured out how to use the little push scooter. And so I do a lot of stuff outdoors with the kids because um, I like to be outside. Um, and then, you know, I love going out and up into the mountains. Um, you'll see on my Instagram that we were, we were up at uh, Suncadia last week and we saw deer. And so uh, I was like waving to buck. Uh, <laughs> I'm taking job applications. Guys. I remember seeing that. Yeah, seeing <laughs> yeah. That, yeah. So yeah, I just I just like to be outside. So anything outside, whether it's you know sports or or yeah, I don't think most people outside of Seattle realize how close like like snow skiing and snowboarding is here to Seattle. Right? It's like pretty like within driving distance. Yeah, I don't think people don't realize that. Yeah, it's really it's really great. But I mean, even if you aren't in Seattle, there's there's tons of fun outside stuff you can do. Yes. Yeah. So how do you go about hiring people? Are we talking about a little before the process? Is this something you do a lot or is like you, you keep pretty keep small teams? Yeah, I'd say, well, so if you're talking about Z counting, we probably hire 20 people a month across the portfolio of clients. But, you know, I think that using an outside payroll company um, like Gusto or Insperity or even ADP, ADP is not my favorite, but they're a great example. I think a lot of people have heard about is if you can, outsource the compliance portion of hiring people. It makes the boring stuff about hiring really easy to do. And so I think one, create a good process to hire people um, that's auto compliant. And so the other thing is where people get in trouble is if they uh, pay people payroll, but don't pay the taxes, uh, they're going to get caught. Yeah. Right. And the IRS is going to come for you and there's huge penalties on not paying your employees. And in some cases we've been able to work away these penalties and get them waived and stuff like that for our clients. Uh, or, I mean, they weren't our clients when they were being <laughs> naughty, but you know, we've helped fix their problems. Um, but you know, not every IRS agent's willing to waive those fees and they take payroll very seriously. So back to cigar and startups, 
where do you get the cigars from? Do you have like a, a supplier, so to speak, <laughs> or you fly them from Cuba or? Yeah. So, so I've got a little private airplane that we fly down to Cuba <laughs> twice a week. No, I'm just joking. Um, so, um, it was probably 15 years ago. Um, there was a little cigar shop called FK Kirsten and, um, it's essentially a, a woman who's fourth or fifth generation tobacconist here in Seattle. Their first location was that fisherman's terminal a hundred years ago. Right. And so um, I'd met, I'd met the owner of that. And since I like cigars, I went in there and I always bought cigars in person opposed to online because you have someone to talk to about it and teach you and, and, and help you learn. I think learning is important. Right. And so as I worked with her, there was always those cigars where she had, you know, an opportunity to buy a couple extra boxes that she just wouldn't go through that fast. Or um, she had some older stuff that was really great stuff, but it wasn't as cool anymore. And so I thought, you know, for cigars and startups, I want to have an excuse to go back home to my wife and say, honey, I was working while reeking of cigars and alcohol. But, um, but I also wanted to help the, this other small business because I really cared about uh, independent tobacconist existing. And so this was essentially my way to get a free stock of cigars for my personal use, but also help move some of her stuff where she got an opportunity to buy more on a promotion or discount, or if there's stuff that wasn't moving as fast as she'd like it to. Yeah. When I was stationed in Korea for a couple of years, I had a friend who owned a, a cigar shop in a, in a so high downtown. Once a month, he would fly into tobacconist from Cuba, right? And, oh, really? And he would, he would, it was like, I think I'm making a number of like $300 at like four, four roll cigars in front of you and hotel room and a dinner, right? <laughs> And he would actually roll this in front of you, right? It's just the coolest experience ever. That's awesome. Yeah, there's actually a cigar roller that, I, that I'd that i worked with um, out in Redmond called San Juan Cigars here. That, that They roll cigars. There's a couple guys who just like cigars and they started rolling it. So, yeah, you should look them up. They're, they're cigars. They do a lot of aging um, sort of with whiskey barrels and stuff like that, too. And how often do you smoke cigars? Quite a bit, right? <laughs> well, you know, uh, I'm I'm trying to get life insurance right now, so I'd say okay. no more than their maximum requirement. Okay. But you know, it's um, I, I think that cigars are very different from other tobacco. Oh yeah, I definitely products. agree. I definitely agree. And so, um, yeah, I <laughs> I smoke a lot of cigars. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. So, yeah. Andrew, I understand you have a gift for our listeners today. Sure. Yeah. So, you know, we were talking before about, uh, is there anything that Z counting can give to the listeners and help them out? And, and I was telling Jason about how, since I started the business, uh, I really started it to help entrepreneurs. And so I said, I'd give a half hour to any entrepreneur that just wanted to run an idea by me or wanted to ask a question. So if they want to come in, uh, come to our website and click on the meet link, um, they can pick a half hour and I'll meet with them for free and help them navigate any problem or question or issue that they have and help set them on the right path. If they're a great accounting client, I'd love to help them do accounting. But, you know, in, in general, as an entrepreneur, it's really lonely and it's great to get some transparent feedback other than the yes people that you tend to surround entrepreneurs. And so I'm willing to tell an entrepreneur that they need to go back and validate their idea better. Or, hey, here's the next step you need to take to get that investor funding. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm offering any entrepreneur that wants to sign up on my website for a free consultation. I'll give them a free consultation uh, with a desire to help them meet their next milestone. Andrew, thanks for that. Can you give us your social media for yourself and your company so people can reach out to you? Yeah, so our, so our company is Z Counting. So it's, uh, I, I was originally trying to get accounting.com because web domains are so so important and accounting.com was taken. And so then I was like, well, what about book counting, right? Book counting was taken, cook counting was taken. And so I finally got to Z and <laughs> Z counting was available. And so it's Z C C O U N T I N G.com. That's funny. And so listeners, we have the link to his gift and his social media links in our show notes. You can find the show notes at www.kevinstatesallblog.com and be sure to share this episode with all your friends. So Andrew, we'll come to the end of our talk. Can you give us advice and wisdom or anything you want to talk about? <laughs> well, I, I think right now in this lockdown, get outside and enjoy the weather. Here in Seattle, it's been pouring rain for a week. Go outside and enjoy the rain. You know, just enjoy the fact that you're alive. Take a big breath and, and you know, do whatever inspires you. Andrew, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks so much. It's been a pleasure. And so listeners, thank you for, for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.